Hey Rep Bags, it's Jade. Welcome to a Lord of the Rings Return to Moria developer Q&A roundup. They've given about 28, I would say, new answers for lots and lots of questions being given from Discord that they had recently, and I'm going to break it down. Paraphrasing quite a lot. I'm not going to be showing clips from the devs. I will leave the link to the full vlog if you want to go and check it out for yourself, but it's about an hour long video, so I feel like I'll just paraphrase it and get it to you in about 13 minutes or so. Some stuff we've heard before, some stuff we haven't, lots of things expanded on. So I feel like this has actually been a pretty good video for them to have done. And hopefully my little recap is going to set you on the way. Return to Mario, of course, is coming out on 24th October to PlayStation 5 and Epic Game Store with an Xbox release at some point early next year. And I am pretty looking forward to it. I love the story and lore of Lords of the Rings. And hopefully this game can deliver with a compelling survival experience. If you do find this video useful, do leave a like and make sure you're subscribed. Let's go. So, when is the game set? Obviously, we know it's the fourth age, but apparently it is roughly really centered on Gimli's adventures. Gimli, apparently in the Lord of the Rings lore, went about setting out all sorts of repair works of things like Minas Tirith and trying to find certain places, also discovering the glittering caves in Helm's Deep and a lot more. Effectively, he was a more of an adventurer than I think people might give him credit for, and this is why he set a band of dwarves to go and hopefully reclaim Moria and that's pretty much where the game sets off from. They got in a special Tolkien language expert because there wasn't actually much Dwarven really written in the Lord of the Rings sagas like there's a few key words and stuff so they obviously had to expand and make stuff up quite a bit themselves and they worked with this expert and that's how they got with a lot more Dwarven language in the game than you might give it credit for. Now, if you don't know, you can take your character to other worlds. So when you join your friend's world, remember it is a co-op game, you will be able to take all your infantry. So if you've got a badass axe, sword, gear set or whatever, you can bring that to your friend's world and hopefully cause some carnage or help them out. However, you will not be able to bring the recipes that you unlock. So if you've completed the game and you go and join your friend who's on like day one, day two, then he won't be able to necessarily take use of your recipes or craft a billion brand new swords or end game items. It's only what you can fit in your inventory and your character that you'll be able to take with you. They've said that the Dwarven character customization is pretty expansive. There's a lot of things that you can do with your character and they've also pretty much give you the option to re-edit your character so it looks like you'll be able to change how your Dwarf looks as you play and progress through the game. We are in the full phage and our armor and weapons reflect that, hence why you're not just going to be making the most basic wooden sticks or swords to fight creatures. You have got the ability to make certain aspects a little bit more advanced, unlike most other survival games, which they were keen to point out. As you progress, you will unlock deeper and deeper more places and you will find more armors associated with the third age, the second age and the first age, with the first age being the top tier of armor and weapons. And that's how you progress. There are no stats to level up on your dwarf. Everything comes from what armor you're wearing and what weapons you're using or potentially what buffs you've got from food. As you would expect, enemies do get harder as you progress. You'll come across variants or some enemies that have different abilities that they can inflict on you, like poison. And the idea is that when you come across a new area, it may be a bit too tough for you. So you have to go a little bit light and carefully before you can get the materials to make brand new armor sets from that area to then be able to take on the enemies adequately. Though keen to point out, it's based more on the armor you're wearing rather than skill when it comes to combat. Has to be said, it's probably the biggest criticism I've seen of the game is the combat looks kind of clunky and a bit old fashioned. In the realms of an action adventure game like God of War and stuff like that, then yes, absolutely, I agree. In terms of comparing to other survival games, yeah, I would still say it's probably not the most advanced, but I wouldn't say it's the worst I've seen. They were asked how things will scale up with multiplayer and basically it will scale up. Enemies will get harder. You may maybe encounter more of them as you progress with more of your friends joining, but resources won't necessarily double up. So you may have to be a bit more careful about what kind of materials you're gathering and who's going to get what in terms of armor, weapons or other stuff. The end game will have a complete story to it, but after that it's going to be much more sandbox as you explore and the game will expand even more much longer. 
Now I'm reading these questions in how they came up in the actual Q&A, but effectively they're jumping around a little. Mods, is there gonna be mod support? No official mod support, but they've said they're not against it. So if players want to mod, I'm guessing using third party sites like Nexus and stuff, then you will be able to find a game on PC at least maybe that possibly can have mods in it, but it's not something that they're gonna officially support because they're simply just a, too much of a small studio to bait that into the game. Return to Moria is a procedurally generated game, but the tile sets that you basically encounter, these caverns, these areas, these fortresses or towns underneath, they have pretty much got set components. It's just about how or where they're placed. So you may have a world that has the mines of Moria a bit closer or potentially other places with certain rare resources a little bit easier to get to and then you might start up another run and it might be a bit further along and it depends on the directions that you're going in as well and there's all sorts of different ways that you can explore by breaking through the dirt into the next cavern. And this is the answer for seeds and how they affect your gameplay. This is what the procedural generation aspects of it is. They want to add a new game plus, mainly so they can also add customization options for game modes. Looks like there's going to be just one game mode that you'll play Return to Moria in when it launches, but they're looking to add the ability to make the game either easier or harder at some point next year. I do kind of question why they haven't launched it in early access. It does feel like a lot of stuff as they spoke about in this Q&A. They've got big plans for and they want to support the game for a couple of years. But maybe it would have been better just to label it early access and maybe not get such harsh criticisms from being a full release game, especially if we've got quite big plans. But that's what I've said anyway. How long is the game actually being able to be played for? Well, in the beta, they said some people managed to scale or run through it all in 24 hours. Other people spent over 100 in just a tiny slice of the beta. They reckon if you were to streamline and go straight just through the mainline quests and story aspects, it could still be up to 40 hours. If you build a few side bases, explore a bit more, just meander a little bit more, maybe something like 60. And of course, if you've got other goals in mind, building huge things or restoring huge parts of the places that you come across, then you could obviously, yeah, run into hundreds. Also next year, they do plan to add more meal systems, decor and lighting options, as well as more defenses. And that's all gonna be planned over next year with updates. They've obviously got music in the game, but people remarked that in the showcase they had for Gamescom, that there wasn't exactly loads of music and it felt quite quiet. They said that's a deliberate choice. They want it to be more suspenseful. So music is there, but they've tried to make it a little bit more minimal to add to that suspense. From their feedback sessions they've had, they've noted that the game simply was just maybe still a bit too easy, so they have now gone and made it a lot harder, all based on what the players gave them feedback on. Again, more things planned for in the future, photo mode and also the ability to scale and change UI and stuff. Really exciting aspect they spoke about was that breach moment that you'll be breaking through the dirt and then you won't know what's in this next area. Is it going to be a giant mine? Is it going to be somewhere pretty to set up a base? Or is it going to be another orc encampment? But this definitely feels exciting to the team and this feels like it's going to be one of these big moments that a lot of players are going to appreciate. That excitement of what lies beneath the next dirt wall. It's not just dwarven architecture and remnants that you'll find in the mines. Apparently elven quarters are going to exist as they were once great friends. There is a mixing and there would be a special home for some of the elves helping out or interacting with the dwarves. So you are going to come across that. You may see influences of the elven architecture actually flowing through certain quarters of the dwarven areas too. There's a rich variety of different types of dwarves all scattered from around the realms of Middle Earth. And they effectively based it on a lot of mixing of cultures and ancient ways and peoples to give it a bit more flavour to hopefully differentiate a lot more between the dwarves so they're not all just looking the same. I'm kind of blending with a question later talking again about the origins of some of the dwarves and how they got them to look how they look. Just utilising ancient history for humans and stuff and basically inspiring some of the looks of the other dwarves and how they would be different from each other. Also, you can customize your weapons and armor, not naming them yet. That's something they think is a good idea and might add in the future. But effectively, you'll find special gems. And with these gems, you'll be able to inscribe rooms that will give specific certain buffs to your weapons and armor. You'll be able to change the color and the hue of certain pieces of armor and stuff like that as well. But one thing they noted was that helmets and shields are going to plateau in terms of levels that you find. 
They've done this so they're not they're avoiding hopefully everyone just looking the same min maxing gear that everyone's going to be wearing exactly the same arm sets then at least this way by having a certain level that can only be reached with helmets and shields it will give players a chance to have their own sort of custom build against their friends they plan to add a lot more runes as development goes on as well to give more buffs in certain aspects to weapons to make them more unique too They've done a lot of work on the orcs and goblins to really enhance how nasty they are. They're meant to be the big bads, and so we're going to be fighting a lot of them. They are going to be the main enemy type, so they use a lot of, obviously, direct lore and inspiration from the books, but also added, injected a bit more evil into their orcs and goblins. We've seen some footage of them singing together. That gives you some sort of bonus, but apparently drinking and eating together as dwarves will also give you some sort of bonuses as well to have a little bit more light-hearted element in the game, not just sort of super dark and oppressive or in combat against the trolls, but have something just to break it up a little. Why is there no Balrog? They've said simply they didn't want a kind of take away from the previous work and story and that really it would undercut Gandalf's story if they added a Balrog like it may be the home of them if you ask a certain set of nerds they'll say there should only be one Balrog if you ask others there's plenty of Balrogs roaming around Middle Earth from the ancient ancient ages so who knows there could have been another one but they didn't want to undercut Gandalf's story this is about the dwarves and not him and so they've got other things obviously that you'll face off against bosses and stuff but not the actual Balrog Devs were asked what they're most proud of, and the standout answer for me was working with the actor behind Gimli, obviously in the movies, his narrations peppered throughout and story, he's involved a lot, and basically how the team stuck to their vision of the game. This isn't a huge development team, this isn't a corporate team, as they also mentioned their next answer. It's really something made by a small indie team with a small indie publisher, not something massive and big. And they're glad that they managed to stick through that all through getting the idea off the ground during COVID and producing it to where it is now over the last three years. Some of their biggest challenges have been how to make proc gen work and basically all the remote working that the dev team did and melding the story to proc gen as well. And finally revealed there's a new character called Arak who's going to help you throughout the game. Not much more was said, simply that it was just someone that's going to help you and guide you through. So there we go, hopefully that's got you a bit more hype for the game. If you are really excited about this, do let me know in the comment section down below. I'm just pleased there is a new survival game come to PlayStation. It's been so long since there's been something really new and something cool. I love Lords of the Rings, I'm not a complete nerd with the lore, but I absolutely love the movies and the books. And I'm eager and keen to see what this game will actually be like once it's here. Glad to hear they've got big plans for the future, and obviously hopefully the game does well enough that it can support that for even more. And as promised, I will start ramping up more and more Return to Moria, so you'll be finding all sorts of videos diving deeper into combat, any more gameplay they show off, whether it be on TikTok, or hopefully some bigger, longer format videos that I can talk about, and any other interviews. From the q and I really got the sense that they really respect the lore and the story, and that's become a big focus. They've also done a recent interview talking about how lore has informed the game's development at first, more than some of the other aspects. Of course, you can go and check out the full hour long vlog video yourself. I'll leave it in the actual comment section down below. And until next time, Rat Bags, I will see you later.